You're gonna tell me everything from the beginning. Where are your friends now, huh? We have ways of making you talk. What happens to you matters. It matters to all of us. Ah, he's not gonna talk. But that has me wondering, what does the snow know about climate change? Snow, glorious snow. The thing that grabs the most attention when it's in my forecast. The mystery of it, the delight in it, the fear of it. Fascination with the white stuff is especially pronounced in Canada. We are a nation of snow. 65% of our landmass is covered by snow for more than six months of the year. But that's changing as our planet warms and the change is having big consequences. First of all, snow is bright, which means a huge amount of sunlight that hits the snow is reflected back into space instead of warming the earth. But as we lose snow cover, the land becomes darker, the colors of soil or vegetation, which absorbs the sun's energy instead, like wearing a black t-shirt on a hot day. Snow is also like a giant blanket, insulating the soil beneath the snowpack to protect plants and animals from cold winter temperatures. The depth and timing of that winter snow impact the ecosystems hidden below, including for us humans. Many parts of Canada rely on winter snowpacks for drinking water. The accumulation of snow during the winter and subsequent melting in the spring and summer regulate runoff and stream flow. Snow is also vital for hydroelectric power generation, for winter sports, tourism, and travel. And it's a key part of the way of life for many indigenous people who've depended on snow for their livelihoods for thousands of years. Most of Canada has already experienced a decrease in snow accumulation by a rate of five to 10% per decade since the 80s. And we're getting that first snow later and the spring melt earlier. These trends will only accelerate as our planet continues to warm. To learn more about how climate change is impacting our snowpack, we travel to Strathcona Provincial Park on Vancouver Island to meet up with Bill Floyd, a research hydrologist who spends most of his job outside in the snow. So Bill, big picture, why is snow so important? I've been thinking about this question and my whole career I've been thinking about this Probably. question. Probably. <laughs> but the, in the context of today, I mean, we're in an area that the most obvious thing why it's important is because look what we're doing. Yeah. We're skiing on it. Yeah. And culturally it's really important, right? There's mm -hmm. ski industry, there's winter industry, there's all kinds of things that rely on snow. When we zoom out from just our like immediate needs and connection of touching the snow, snow at a big scale is a really important source of water in terms of drinking water supply or just general water supply. It acts as a, as a, as a storage unit mm -hmm. that delays the exit of that water from a system. So in the winter, in high elevation, your snow accumulates and accumulates and accumulates. And then during the spring and summer, it slowly melts. That's the ideal situation is a slow melt and it contributes to water that's required for fish, water that's required for people. Wait, the size of the snowpack also affects animals. Let's go down the rabbit hole. Southern Mountain Caribou are a population of woodland caribou known as snow caribou. They're unique in that their huge hooves allow them to float on deep snow to reach arboreal lichen, their main winter food source. These caribou depend on large patches of old growth forests to survive, especially through tough winters. Industrial development and extraction, primarily logging, have impacted the old growth forests that these caribou depend on. We've seen this population decline by alarming 30% in the last 15 years. Snow caribou are well adapted to living in deep snow, and they use this to their advantage by heading to the higher elevations in winter, where they can escape predators, especially wolves. Decreasing amount of snow from climate change limits their access to their main winter food source, lichen found on trees. It also means predators are able to navigate the higher terrain, putting caribou at greater risk. This is doubled with pressure from logging and habitat fragmentation, which leaves caribou vulnerable. Caribou are an important cultural species to people across Canada. They are also considered an indicator species, meaning that they reflect the health of a larger ecosystem. If caribou are declining, it means that the forests and watersheds that we also depend on are in trouble. 
Protecting the old growth forests that Southern Mountain Caribou call home is important not just for the survival of the iconic species, but as a natural solution to climate change to help us mitigate and adapt to a change of climate. <laughs> Should we go play in it? Yes. <laughs> yes. Let's get in the snow. I mean, we can dig in it. We're going to measure it. Let's today. dig in it. So. Okay. This is a type of ruler. So by driving this into the ground, you get a snow depth. The other thing is it's hollow. Yeah. And it collects a core and a core of snow. So you can take that core of snow, lift it out, and then you weigh it. Right. And then that weight tells you basically how heavy that water is, the mass of that water. And from that, you can figure out how much water is stored in the snowpack. Forecasting snow water equivalent for snow events is one of the hardest parts of my job. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I can maybe. Do you I'll... usually make bets before you measure <laughs> well, how we, deep it is? We know how deep it is. The bets are, the bets are usually like density, like how dense uh, is the snow. So how much does it weigh? I'm going to say that the density is probably like, I'll say 32 percent. Okay. I, I may be wrong. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say, uh, 52%. 52%. Okay. So you probably, you'll feel it sort of biting into something that doesn't feel like snow. That's moss. Yeah. Dirt. So what did we get? So we did that, that, uh, density measurement and I, I estimated 30%, Joanna estimated 50 and it was 50.1. <laughs> I would say beginner's luck but I'm going to chalk it up to um, my meteorology skills. Ooh. This is how we get one measurement in one place and doing these in enough places you can get a picture but in order to get a bigger picture you use other tools right like weather definitely, stations. Definitely. So we use weather stations which tell us they don't necessarily give us more spatial representation as, as something like this so we could do a, we could measure this whole opening take 50 of these measurements which will describe this really well the weather station is is essentially only going to be describing a relatively small footprint but it's going to be doing it every five minutes let's go see one so this this station um is different than a lot of stations you'll see different than the province it has more instruments than you would normally yeah. see that measures snow depth through sonic signals so it's called a sonic snow ranger okay which essentially if you listen and we're close to it it would go tick 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 and that sound bounces off the snow surface and then back up to the sensor it measures how long it takes for that signal to bounce off the snow and back and from that you get a distance to the snow surface right and you also when there's no snow on the ground you get a distance to the ground so you actually subtract that distance to the ground bare earth ground from the snow surface and that's how you get snow depth. So we've got these, these manual measurements we've taken. We have weather stations, but they don't describe a very big area. Now we have this plane that flies in the sky or helicopter that can map snow depth instead of over square meters, over hundreds of square kilometers. Wait, there's more. Derek, thanks for meeting me on the slopes. My pleasure. Always uh, take a chance to get to the ski hill. I, I thought so. I thought you were gonna maybe do a couple of runs after this. Can you tell me how the remote sen sensing technology you use works? Sure, so Hakai Institute has a mapping platform, we call it the Airborne Coastal Observatory. And that is essentially a plane with a series of mapping systems on board. And so the main, the main system that we use is a laser scanner and it's, it's an active sensor, meaning it has its own source of, of energy and it is emitting a pulse of energy to the ground and there's targets on the ground that that pulse of energy reflects off of, comes back to the plane, and we can measure the two-way travel time of that pulse of energy and basically attach a range to it. So in, in great precision and accuracy, we're able to map in a cloud the terrain below uh, the airplane. And so that gives you the ability to estimate snow depth over a large area in a relatively short period of time? It does. The, the key thing is to be able to repeat the same areas. And so if we're able to fly over a given area, 
uh, in the summer, say, when there is no snow, and then we will repeatedly map that same area throughout uh, the winter, say once a month, we're able to see how the snow fluctuates and how that fluctuates over space. So how has this changed the game when it comes to measuring snowpack? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the, the type of work that Bill Floyd and his team do, where they're in the field and they're taking direct measurements in situ, you're basically getting all these points on a grid, and so you're trying to interpolate between those. But with the Airborne Coastal Observatory, we're able to look at an entire area. So it's like a television where if you turn it on, you're only looking at a couple pixels that turn on with, with uh, the field measurements. As soon as the Airborne Coastal Observatory is taking measurements, the whole TV lights up. That's a great analogy. So what trends have you already seen when it comes to climate change in our snowpack? But what we've been seeing is basically in some areas, declines or rapid pulses of snow um, in some areas. Where we are right now um, at Mount Washington has for the, the past many weeks and months, I think, been on, um, on a, uh, have had an issue with drought and, and water scarcity. So I think that's lifting now with the snow coming in, but it's a concern for sure. Well, I better let you uh, test it out officially on the skis, I feel like. I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I'll figure it out.